This is Project Management for You. Are you a solopreneur, individual, or small business owner who struggles with ideas and lacks converting those ideas into reality? Do you underpromise? Afraid you won't deliver. Learn the least you need to know to start your path of turning ideas into reality and delivering on your promises. Each episode is designed to help you get things done. Welcome to Project Management for You with Caesar Abade. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the third episode of the Project Management for You podcast series. I am Cesar Abade, your host, and it is great to have you here. Um, if you are a, a subscriber of the Project Management for the Masses podcast, uh, uh, welcome. And if you are a new subscriber to the brand new feed called Project Management for You, if you found me in iTunes or on Stitcher or just around the web somewhere, welcome. On this show, I bring you my conversations with the best project managers I know as we try to break down and explain project management to you so you too can start turning your ideas into reality, delivering on your promises, and getting things done. Now, I'm extremely excited because at the same time that this podcast series is airing, I'm, I am actually running a Kickstarter campaign that will help me fund the, the, the costs of self-publishing my first book that will be called Project Management for You. If you'd like more information on that, you can visit projectmanagementforyou.com and and see what's going on. Uh, this is uh, the the campaign has been up for less than twenty four hours, and I'm happy to say that I'm uh, as of right now. <laughs> it's four fifty two p.m. on the on the next day of my campaign, and I'm over eleven percent funded. So uh, it's looking really promising, guys. So thank you very much for your support so far. So let's talk about today's show. Today I bring you my friend Carl Pritchard, and we will break down project management and explain it to you in the way that only Mr. Pritchard can. Carl Pritchard is the principal and founder of Pritchard Management Associates. As a lecturer, he's considered a leading authority on risk and communications management and presents on a variety of management topics. He has published articles on project management language, advances in risk management, and on the challenges of training on the internet. Carl's work as an instructor has taken him around the world, training with some of the leading international training organizations as well as for private clients. Carl is also well known for having written the risk management chapter of the Project Management Body of Knowledge, or the PMBOK Guide, 4th edition. Today's special guest and project manager extraordinaire is up next. Hello, Carl. How are you? I'm great. How are you, Cesar? I'm doing well. Love listening to your radio voice. It's great. Uh, Yeah, keep talking. No one's stopping you. (laughs) Now, Carl, you've been on the Project Management for the Masses podcast before, talking about risk management. And we we were just talking about this before I I pressed the record button here. I often use you as a good example of of, uh, people who have uh, chosen something they want to be known for. And you are the risk management guy. I am the risk guy. Absolutely. It's the voodoo I do. <laughs> uh, right. So I'm, I'm glad that so, there's somebody out there who is passionate about risk and, and, and willing to create content and write books on the topic. So thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> now, Carl, you um, have a long experience with project management and speaking to pro- working with project managers, delivering projects and, and, and all that jazz. So, for the listener right now who is not familiar with project management or the project management lingo, how would you define project management to them? I think, I think probably the, the simplest way to describe it is common sense codified. Mm-hmm. It, it really is. And, and that's the thing that I always kind of find kind of shocking is that people look at project management as being something mysterious and something highly technical and all that stuff. And that would be crap. The reality is that um, project management is basically doing a lot of the stuff that we do and understand and just normally do as part of our day-to-day routine and just putting down kind of some rules around it. And, and, and that is fundamentally what we do. It's not that hard. When I, when I first got into it, and I've, I've been a project manager for about 25 years now, 
but when I first got into it, I was like, oh, they're asking so much of me. They want me to know all this stuff. And I was so terrified of it. And, and, and as I started going to the classes and taking the trainings and everything else, I, I came to a harsh realization. It's like, oh, my gosh, these people know nothing more than I do. It's just a matter of they've got a basic set of rules as to how to be normal. And I was actually very encouraged by that. You know, just the whole idea that project management is basically getting stuff done in an ordered fashion. That's really what it is. Very interesting. And, and I agree with you. When I started studying project management, I, well, uh, the difference is you, you, <laughs> you were doing that before and I wasn't. I, w I was not getting anything done. I was a mess until I started uh, studying this and said, man, I can apply this to, to my life. I can apply this to anything. And all of a sudden, I became a more productive and individual that is reliable. And that's the reason I'm talking to you today, Carl, is because of project management and, uh, and what it has done for my life. And that's why I have a passion for it. That's why I wanted to have you here today to talk about it. Well, I think, I think something you just said, though, is really kind of important. And that, that is the whole notion of it, it becomes part of your day-to-day -day life. And, and that, for me, was like you. It was kind of a big realization. It was, oh, wow. This doesn't just apply to my work life. This applies to my home life. This applies to everything from you know, not too long ago. We, we decided to get a dog. My wife, we had never had a dog. My wife and I have been married for 30 years, never had a, never had a dog. We had cats, but we were not dog people and found out that getting a dog is a much more involved process than getting a cat. And the interesting thing was, My, my wife, who is equally anal retentive, um, was perfectly comfortable with the notion of let's get together, let's break this down into the bunch of little things that have to happen in order to get to the achievement. And the achievement was ultimately just getting the dog. And there, there's a certain beauty to this in that you start realizing it becomes part and parcel of everything you do, from vacation planning to getting the dog to uh, the, the heavy metal work that we actually have to do on our jobs. The listener might be, I, I, I don't agree with this, but people might be thinking, doesn't that take a little bit uh, of spontaneity out of life? It, you know what? It does. And I am perfectly comfortable with that. I really am. I, I, you know, spontaneity is, is, is something that is, some people genuinely prize, but the reality is spontaneity also drives risk. And being the risk guy, I am trying to minimize risk in my life, and there is a certain joy to knowing that things are going to happen at a given point in time. There will always be outside influences. There will always be things that happen on the fly. But if you have a game plan as to where you want to go, if you actually have the little pieces it takes to get there, then if something comes up, you get to make an intelligent choice of, ah, I'm not in any hurry. I'm going to go be spontaneous. Or, you know what? I've got to get this done. I can't afford to be spontaneous right now. And you actually get choices that you wouldn't otherwise have. Mm -hmm. I spoke with David Allen from Getting Things Done once, and uh, he said it's a lot easier to be spontaneous in the kitchen if the kitchen is clean and the pantry is full. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So let's say people want to get started on this path of, of getting things done. What is the least, in your opinion, the least people need to know about project management? Two things, and that would be smart objectives and the work breakdown structure. And, and just to kind of put those in terms of, in, in more layman's terms, if you might, and that is first, you need to know where you're going. And, and that's, that's really kind of crucial. You need to know how the world is going to look different when you're done. All too often, we, 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 we start on some endeavor with this, well, I've got to uh, you know, paint the windowsill. That kind of thing. You know, we'll, we'll take some benign little task that we're, we're out to do without thinking about how do we actually want the world to look different when we're done. If we know how we want the world to look different when we're done, then we can go from there. We could actually build almost any way to get there. Weddings are a classic example. Weddings consistently get completely, utterly, totally out of control. People have just, you know, spent billions on weddings. And 
It's insane. But if you know what is the outcome you're driving for, then getting to that point, you can start asking the smarter questions, which are, well, you know what? That doesn't really necessarily contribute to the outcome. If the outcome is we have a, a, a true memory on our hands, we were able to enjoy the moment of our union with our friends, we were able to just show our true love one for the other. If those are the things you're driving for in your wedding, it doesn't have to be an 800-person affair. And you start coming to that realization. You come to very intelligent realizations when you can actually set an objective by saying, okay, when we're done, how do we really want the world to look different? And start there and work our way back. All too often, people get wrapped up in the process getting from here to there and never get there as a result. Mm -hmm. What do you think, uh, what do you say to, uh, to, to someone listening right now who maybe they don't know? exactly what they want until they, they start. And, and because of that, they, they don't take action. Yeah. Well, and, and in that case, I'd say, okay, what, what is one small first step? And it's kind of interesting. Uh, if you ever saw the movie, what about Bob in, in, <laughs> in the movie with uh, Bill Murray? And if you've, if you've ever seen this movie, the, Bill Murray is just psycho. And, He spends this entire, the, the entire first part of the movie just on, I'm, I'm baby stepping toward the door. I'm baby stepping down the hall. I'm baby stepping down the sidewalk. And he's talking about the fact that he's, he's basically getting as far as he can see and as far as he can stand given his current set of parameters. And I'm fine with that. If you can't plan the whole wedding, if you can't get out to the where, where you're looking at wedded bliss as being the long-term goal, then maybe you want to look at, at, at something much, much smaller. I just want to be happy after a first date. You know, that might, that might be as far as you want to go. And that much you can generally wrap your arms around. You can at least find a first step. But for that, you have to define what success looks like. You know, success for some people after a date may be that they got their first kiss. For other people, it might be, I survived and didn't throw up on my date. <laughs> yeah, that, it, it, it's, it's a radical difference from person to person. And this is why we need to define, you know, look, as long as she walked away happy, I walked away happy, we had a good date. That's, that may be all you're gunning for. And... The key, though, is to make sure that you have some common set of values that you understand and know what done looks like, even if it's for that little baby step. And, and that ties back to the work breakdown structure. Now, I mentioned that. And that's a common term of art in project management. And people, yeah, you know, they get wrapped up in terminology. And when, when people started throwing the WBS at me, I was always like, okay, you lost me. It's nothing more than the steps it takes to get something done. A WBS is nothing more than the steps it takes to get something done. Now, WBS doesn't put them all in order yet. That's done later. But the first thing to do and, and is to just basically identify what has to get done to color this done. I'm working on a huge project for one of my finance clients right now, and, and it's been enormous. It was a matter of video recording, some training, and doing backup in audio, and having ongoing lesson plans that they're able to read and then submit their lessons after they're done with them. All this stuff has been very, very ornate. It's a big e-learning e package, as it were. And if I just looked at this and said, okay, I've got to get all this done, I would have freaked out. But today, for example, my goal today is to write five pages of content for the backup support documentation that goes with it. That's it. That's my big goal for today. I can do that. You know what? I can actually do that, Cesar. I, I can. And it's a beautiful thing because at the end of the day, I'm going to do my little happy dance at my desk because I got that done. Now, is the whole project done? Heck no. But at least I made forward progress. What, uh, people ask me, I've written seven books on project management, seven books. And, and people ask me, you know, how do you find the time to write seven books? I don't. I find the time to write three pages. That, that's actually how I get books written. I write them three pages a day. 
And if I have a day when I've got too much other stuff going on, I don't write three pages that day. But when I sit down, I promise myself I'm not just going to write a paragraph or two. I'm going to write three pages. And I commit to that. And that becomes something that's achievable. And you might say, well, gee, Carl, a book, some of your books, my, my, my risk management textbook, that's, that's like 200 plus pages. Yeah. Broken down in three page chunks. And that's how work gets done. That's how you're able to, you, know, you look at some people and go, how do they get all that stuff done? They're doing it in three page chunks. Baby step. Baby step, yeah. baby step. Down the hall. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite part of that movie is the I'm swimming. No, oh, I'm sailing. I'm, <laughs> I'm sailing. I'm sailing. I'm tied to the post. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. So he got to that point by baby steps and he sailed. That's right. All right. So you talked about maybe defining requirements and uh, the work breakdown structure. And that's, uh, I agree with you, that's uh, fundamental to. to uh, to the to, to projects. I mean, knowing what, what you want to do and then how it breaks down into smaller chunks. So do you believe that there are stages of, because, well, step back a little bit. I also believe that project management is also bringing an idea to reality. You agree? Yeah, amen. All yeah. right. So do you believe there are stages to, uh, of, to bringing an idea to reality? And if so, what are they? I, I'd say, yes, there are stages to that. And, and the, the first thing is, is a fundamental belief system. And that is, you've got to believe in the outcome. It goes back to setting down those specific measurable objectives, something where you can say, I know what done looks like. One, one, of, the, one of the great tragedies for a lot of people, and the thing that inhibits a lot of forward progress for a lot of folks, is rather than identifying you know, what the end looks like, they will say, oh, no, 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 I'm going to let it evolve as I go. I'm gonna, and you use the word spontaneous. I'm just going to do this through, you know, just let a little spontaneity drive how this actually turns out. The problem with that is, in many cases, you don't get done. And motivation book after motivation book after motivation book talks about the importance of getting something done. You want, to, you want to bring an idea to reality, first off, you've got to believe, and you've got to get others around you to believe in the outcome. You, if you want to get a new car. It's not, it's not a solo event. It's something where you're going to actually engage other people in the process, and you have to get them on board with your vision. So the first thing is to know what done looks like and to accept done. It, it, it's kind of noteworthy. I have a uh, daily checklist, and this this is kind of reflective of who I am, but I have a daily checklist, and I want you to know you're on here. It says PM for masses, Caesar. Yeah, there you are. Ta-da. You're on my – as a matter of fact, let me go ahead and check you off. I'm going to mark you done, <laughs> even though you're not done. But I have this little checklist in front of me, and my checklist every day at the top of it ha- – well, first off, my checklist has anywhere from 20 to 40 items on it on a given day. I will never get them all done on a given day. But every single one of those that I check off is done. When it's done, I get to delete it. And I have a little note up across the top of my my checklist that actually says 15 is a triumph. (laughs) If I get 15 check marks on my checklist, I have had a very special day. I really have. It means I got 15 elements of work done. And I think that's, you know, the, 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 the stages of bringing an idea to reality is first, know what done looks like for any given element that you're working on, be it the whole thing, be it the little pieces of the thing. I, I once heard a, uh, a project management speaker of some repute get up and talk about the fact that sometimes you have to go back and redo work. And I almost threw up. I was, I was actually angry, visibly angry at that moment. You don't go back and redo work. You go do new work. Now, granted, it may be to cover something that you already covered, but it's still got to be new work. And if we don't perceive it as new work, this is one of the things that kills ideation. It kills people with big ideas and wanting to get stuff done because it's like I keep going back to this. I mentioned painting the windowsill. There's a reason that that one was actually near and dear to my heart. There was a chip on one of my windowsills in my house. And, and I, I went over to, uh, to just touch it up. 
So I got I got a little can of paint from up at the Sherwin Williams store, and I brought it home, and I I was just going to sand down that spot and just paint over that one little spot. By the way, something very cool at the uh, hardware store these days. When you when you go up to the paint store, you can actually take along a chip of paint, and they can match it perfectly now. They've actually got the little measurement tools. So that I had this little thing that just perfectly matched, and all I and I got the smallest amount of paint possible because all I had to do was just touch up that one spot on the sill. Well, as I started sanding it, it it some of the wood actually flaked off in my hand, and it's like, oh no. Now I gotta get some wood putty, and, and of course, did I have wood putty in the basement? No. And this thing turned what I thought was going to be a half-hour job turned into a half-day job because I was doing wood putty, I was sanding, I was, uh, and I was finding other flaws around the window frame. There was just problem on problem on problem. Welcome to life. Mm-hmm. But I could have looked at that as being so. I got one thing done today. I got that paint spot painted. Or I can look at it as I took on four different tasks today. I supplied my workshop with uh, extra supplies, including the stuff necessary to patch and sand wood. I got the paint. I prepared and sanded down my windowsill. I painted the spot. That's, That's a much bigger thing. And if I look at them as separate tasks, I feel better about myself. If I look at this as I just spun my wheels for a half day, just trying to paint one stupid spot on the windowsill, I will do nothing but frustrate myself. Mm -hmm. A big part of project management and bringing ideas to reality is to kill the frustration. Because we get so frustrated so easily by virtue of just spinning our wheels. If you feel like you're not spinning your wheels, you're moving forward. And if you're moving forward, then you have the potential to bring an idea to reality. Wow. Yeah. And and, and uh, the the window the window example is a perfect one because uh, in it very I don't think there is ever a situation where what you plan is exactly what happens. I mean, it's yeah. Uh, there is always some uh, we call it scope creep. You know, the new things that pop in and we need to do. Be- because we got started, but uh, you don't know until you you start. And what you're saying is you need to maybe have the right mindset, uh, knowing knowing ahead of time that you're going to face some adversities and, and then treat well, them as progress instead of uh, setbacks. Exactly. D- treat them as success. Mm-hmm. I mean, the fact that I actually fixed my windowsill, I- I'm a hero, just in case you didn't recognize that, Caesar, I am a hero. I want you to know <laughs> that. Yeah, because I fixed my windowsill. I, I, I did it. I did not require outside labor. I did not drag in a carpenter. I fixed it myself. Rah, rah. And this is all too often we'll look at something like that and just feel depressed about it when, in fact, those should be our moments of triumph. They should be the times when we're saying, not only did I get something done, I got something much bigger done. I'm, 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 you know, I, bringing an idea to reality is not something that goes in a nice, smooth, linear way. And the key is, though, not to negate or downplay the work you did to get there. A lot of people would have taken that same episode and gone, I got stuck. It was one step forward and eight steps back, and geez, I hate that. And if you take that kind of attitude, stuff will not get done. All right. So let's say if you would you say that the if you could recommend one technique from the project management world, like um, you mentioned the WBS, maybe that's mm-hmm. it. Uh, w- would that be it? And where can we learn how to do it properly? Well, first, l- let me stress it would be the WBS, okay. but it's it's using the WBS in its very simplest form. I, I've actually pitched a book to multiple publishers, and I got to tell you, no one has ever bit. I, I, you know, I've got seven books out there. I still can't get any publisher to bite on this book. Uh, and, and the book, the title of the book would be yellow sticky project management. <laughs> and, and, and the reason I, because I, I think that title would be perfect is because frankly, I believe most of what we do as project managers, and I don't mean people who are just doing a simple home planning project. I'm talking about people doing mega projects. I think most project management can be conducted, at least the planning piece of it, can be conducted using post-it notes. Now, 
you might you might think post-it notes are you know I, I'm sorry Carl I'm not seeing the connection no 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 these are the manageable chunks of the work that we do I actually taught project management to a kindergarten class I uh, I, I when oh, this has been a number of years back but I was invited to a kindergarten class to explain project management now, I want you to think about that these are kids who don't even know how to write yet and how are you going to explain project management to them? It seems like a complex topic for a small group, but it wasn't. What I did was I took a pile of Post-its, and what I had on them were simple pictograms, little pictures, of with stick figures and so forth, of all the steps involved in planning a family picnic. All the things it would take. Little pictures. One had a little drawing of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich on it. You know, all, the, all the basic steps that are involved packing the car, the open trunk, the car driving down the road, that kind of thing. Took all those pieces into a bunch of little kids and said, did I forget anything? Now, that was kind of interesting because some of them had a different vision as to what belongs in a picnic. Some of them were like, no, we, we don't make the sandwiches. We don't have to do that. We go to McDonald's. And it's like, oh, okay. Well, that's, that's fine, too. That works. I'm perfectly content with that. Got some input on some different approaches to picnicking, and that was fine. But what also happened was, and this is the other side of this, once they saw them, I laid out all these Post-its in front of them, and I said to them, I said, let's, let's all come over here to this wall. And what I want you to do, I want each one of you to grab one of my post-its, and I want you to put it where it belongs if that's the start. And then I point it at the other end of the wall, and that's the finish. Does it belong near the start? Does it belong near the finish? Where does it belong? And I want you to put them in order. And one by one, the kids went up, and, and it was interesting because they, hey, 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 don't move my post-it. And I thought that was interesting because that was actually a real life example where I could see, you know, some some senior executive going, hey, hey, don't move my post-it. Yeah. But but it was compelling to watch them do this because what they were doing is one of the fundamental things of project management. They were trying to find a sequence to get things done that made sense to them. And it worked brilliantly. It was so much fun. And I, I, because then I got to ask him the other question, which is, oh, could we do any of these at the same time? And they said, well, it's just me and my mom. I'm, okay, fine. So is there anything you can do while your mom's doing something else? And we went through those kind of endeavors, resource leveling. Resource allocation. Yeah, yeah, resource allocation, rather. And it was, it was interesting to watch them moving the post-its around, getting them all maneuvered into position, and realizing this is actually exactly what we should be doing on the day-to-day -day basis. When, when I first got instructed on using post-its to actually plan out work, and the first class I was in where they used them, I looked at that, and it was like scales fell from my eyes. I was like, how brilliant is that? How simple, how completely, utterly brainless. And yet, what you wind up with is the ability to look at a, a plan, to look at a game plan and say, oh, wow, this is perfect. Only one problem. It's going to take me nine months to do this, and I only have six months to get it done. But at least I've got a jumping off point. At least I've got some sense of, is it achievable? Is there a sequence to this? Does it have to be done this way? I, I got to ask you, um, have you ever seen the video of the world record house being built? The world record house? Uh, yeah. No. No. Okay. It was done. Well, actually, the original and best video on this was out of 1980, mm -hmm. and it was done by the San Diego Building Industries Association. And, and the cool thing about this particular video, and the title of the video is The Four-Hour House. That's the title of the video. And, and the cool thing about them doing this, they're pouring the slab on one piece of property with quick cure concrete. They're pouring the slab while they're building the roof on another part of the property, while they're building the frame on another part of the property. They're basically prefabbing a house on one piece of ground. And then they're 
putting it all together, and they get the whole kit and caboodle down to the finish work and the cabinetry done in under four hours. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, way under four hours. What's, what's amazing as you watch this video happening is you start realizing if we know the pieces of work that have to be done, then, then, and this is where the creative piece comes in, then we can get creative. Then we can get really, really inventive about all this. And it all starts by just breaking things down into chunks we can understand, putting them into what is the most desirable sequence, and then saying, okay, now, where can I break rules? Where can I do something different? How can I approach this that I might not have otherwise considered? And it's amazing how that gives you license, it gives you opportunity. It opens your eyes to other possibilities. It basically sets the stage so that you have a much clearer vision as to when, where, and how you can actually approach this intelligently. And all too often, we say, no, no, I'll, I'll just keep going forward. And if as long as I'm moving forward, I'm doing okay. You might be spinning your wheels, even though you're making forward progress, without realizing it. And you could have been saving yourself a lot of time if you had just taken a look at the whole thing as one big package from the very outset. If you had just looked at it that way. And I think, honestly, if you're looking for like the one tool that I use religiously in almost every aspect of the work that I do, the goofy tool is Post-it Notes. Mm -hmm. I believe in yellow sticky project management. <laughs> I think it's a fine idea for a book, by the way. Yeah, I thought so too. <laughs> All right, so so let's say uh, where where can you recommend a resource for people who want to go and learn how to do um, work breakdown structures? Well, I, I could recommend the book How to Build a Work Breakdown Structure. Okay, uh, that was written by Carl Pritchard okay. um, in 1999. I will add but, that to the to yeah to, uh, that, 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 that link to the show notes. Yeah, that's worth uh, worth adding in there. Uh -huh. But but honestly, if um, one of my favorite, uh, if you're looking for a college textbook on all of this. It would be uh, Project Management, a Managerial Approach by Meredith and Mentel. That is, that's also just a really, really healthy volume. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, Project Management for Dummies. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody kind of like disses the dummies guides, but I, I think they have a lot of value. And that's another place where I would go, oh, one other great book, Project Management. The Briefcase Series by Gary Hirkins. Last name is spelled H-E-E-R-K-E-N-S. And Gary Hirkins' book, the, uh, here's, here's why you'll love this. It's affordable. It's less than 20 bucks. It's thorough. It's well-written. It's simple. It's written in layman's terms. So I really like Gary's book for that, too. Very good. And the uh, listener can, will be able to find the links uh, cool. for all these resources here. That's on, great. On the, part, on, the, on the website. I'll just add a link to them. Thanks for that, Carl. Now, so you have all your stickies <clears throat> and you're trying to get creative and you realize, you know, I'm going to have to bring some people in here to help me, right? Absolutely. What is the best way to know when and what to, to, to delegate to people and, and also to compel them to, to collaborate on a project? Um, it goes back to definable chunks getting work down to a small enough chunk that they actually can get something done you know mcclellan was a social theorist who said everybody has three basic needs they either have the need for power the need for achievement and the need for affiliation and any one of those three can be served here but the key is is to, to make sure you have discrete chunks of work so that if they have a high need to achieve they can actually declare something done. If they have a high need for affiliation, you make sure that when they're doing that, that discrete chunk, they know who it's serving, who it's actually helping, who's going to be the recipient. If you've ever finished, for example, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of stuff we do is just documenting and clerical and administrative. And you'll document something and you'll finish a document that's required by some government agency and you'll finish it. And you'll turn it over to the person who's responsible. It's like, wow, I'm done. At least I think I'm done. But the paperwork's done. I filled out the form. I submitted it. There's no joy 
in that. We have to find the joy there. There's a matter of if, if you want people to engage, you want people to play along, you want people to join, you've got to tell them, you know what happens the moment you finish this? This, this, and this. This person's going to do this with it. This person's going to do that with it. They need to know what whatever it is they're producing has merit and value, where it's going, what other processes and people it's enabling, what doors it's opening. You don't open doors for them. Frankly, they're going to be like, I'm doing this once for you as a favor, and I'm never doing this again. You will never own them as a participant. If you want them to really actively participate in what you're doing, you have to serve their needs. If they've got a high need for power, I love these people. You've got, you know, people, I want power. I just graduated from Stanford. Give me power. It's like, yeah, yeah, Junior, sure. Uh, it's amazing how, how many people think they crave power. You want to give somebody power? Make them in charge. But because they're young, they're new, they're fresh, make them in charge of something very small. One posted. But give them the liberty to do it the way they want to do it. Give them the opportunity to succeed the way they see fit. And by giving them the opportunity to succeed, that also means that you have to shut up and allow them to fail. And that's very, very hard for some of us. We will sit back and stop the bus just because we realize somebody has the potential for failure. Not that they're going to fail. They just have the potential for failure. The hardest thing to do if you really want to get other people to play along nicely is to bite your tongue and let them. Let them do it their way. Some of you have, have children, and, and I'm sure you've been through this drill. You watch your kids, and they're doing something stupid, or you think it's stupid. And you're watching them going, oh, oh no, 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 just don't, James, don't, Adam, please. Those are my sons. Oh, um, that's but, funny, because my son is Adam James. Oh, wow. How bizarre. <laughs> but the point being is you look at them and you're just biting your tongue because you realize they have the potential not to succeed. Mm -hmm. It is so hard to shut up because to give somebody power to true. And, and I hate the term empowerment, but it's what it's rooted in. The whole idea here, if you want to give somebody power, you have to allow them to succeed on their own, which means you also have to allow them to fail. And, that is perhaps the hardest. If you constantly assert yourself into a process and say, no, 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 that's, that's not how it should be done, you will not get their support and their help very often. But if you are willing to let them go up in flames occasionally, you actually will have their ongoing unbridled support. You'll actually get them for the long haul. The key, though, is to tell them, here's what the end looks like. I don't care how you get there, but this is what the end of your little piece of this looks like. That's what I need you to produce, to deliver, to do. How you get there is up to you, Captain. You're in charge. And give them the liberty to do just that, to get there with whatever process they're going to use. And it is so, so hard to just live with the fact that they're not doing it your way. But if you can do that, that's where I think you win a lot of hearts. I think that's where, you know, where people are willing to buy in and be on board and do whatever it is you want to do. You think about the people you'd go to the mat for, they are generally those individuals that have in the past allowed you to do it your way and let you succeed. Because if you do it your way and you succeed, a couple of things happen. For one, for you, it's a personal triumph. For them, they got a chance to prove their approach works and they're Einstein. And if you just made them the smartest person in the room, they'll genuinely appreciate that. Amazing. Amazing value, Carl. This is awesome, awesome insights. Uh, basically understanding how people work, <laughs> what, what uh, makes them, makes them tick and then kind of catering to that. It's, uh, um, uh, you know, it, sh it should be more common sense, but it, amazingly, it's not. So um, very, I, I really like the way you put this. Very good. Thanks. Thank you. So, Carl, I'm just tr starting to, to get to the end here. So what is your final thought for the listener right now who wants to learn and use project management to get things done and move forward in life? I, I, I would say try writing a clean objective. I mean, seriously. 
right right down before you before you ever if if you're assigning out to yourself to somebody else uh just if you have a goal you want to achieve if there's something you want things like gee i really really want a new car i want to get myself in a position where i have a new car well there's a lot of things before you get there. You're going to have to investigate financing. You're going to have to do all the little baby steps it takes to get there. But before you get there, you have to define what does a new car look like? How does the world look different when you're done? Are you cruising down? And I, oh, I was driving down the Pennsylvania Turnpike the other day, and I have to tell you, I got, I passed a 1929 Rolls Royce, and it was just like, whoa! I, I, it was a magic moment for me because I love old, old cars, and it was just one of those things where it's not what you expect to see. Right-hand um, drive? I, right, yeah. Right. Cool. It was, now that you mention it, yes. Yeah, because there was nobody driving. Um, <laughs> but but it was very cool watching this thing sail down the road, and it, it struck me that I had not too long ago bought a new car, and mine was just a, a new Subaru, and I was thinking, wow, I, I could have bought, spent my money on that. And that would have been really cool. The interesting thing is, define what a new car looks like. Is your idea of a new car just a different car from the one you currently own, or is it a truly new car? Is it a 2014? Is it a 2015? Is it a 2016 model? When is new? You know, what what year constitutes new to you? You know, how far out are you looking at this? What criteria does it have to meet? And what does success look like? What does done look like? Is it just the day you get to roll the car home, or is it when you had the car and have survived the warranty period? It, it, if we can define all those elements out, then we can start working toward them. And, and if you're looking for just kind of like the first thing you want to do is, and don't make it something huge and elaborate. Try something small. Just what does done look like? If, if, if it was, having having a dinner a a note done is not when everybody's leaning back at the table going oh that was magnificent done is when the kitchen is clean done is when we can all relax and no longer do any additional work that's what done looks like i'm the cook in our house so i i understand this but it, it it's noteworthy that a lot of people declare done way too early a lot of people never even define what done looks like. If we can just ask and answer the question, when we're done here, how does the world look different? If we can answer that simple question, it, it, it's an amazingly powerful question. By the way, those of you with kids, let me stress to you, that's a nasty question to use on your kids. It really is. Think about that. When we're done here, how does the world look different? Ask them that question sometime especially when they're screaming at you. Those of you with teenagers, you've probably been through this, where your kid is just upset about something. You have no idea, Mom. It's awful. I don't know, I love you. Like, you know, and they're screaming their lungs out at you like it's your fault, whatever's going on. And you look at them and you're like, James, James, when we're done with this conversation, how do you want the world to look different? <laughs> you know, it, it is. It's an amazingly powerful tool up and down the line. If you're looking for a first step, giving that question and answering that question are amazing ways to open doors, to open insights, and to get people headed in the right direction, be it in a very micro scale of just, what am I going to get done this morning? Or on a macro scale, what am I going to get done that leads to the outcome I want five years from now, 10 years from now, as I retire and move on with my life? If you can define what done looks like, there's a real joy in that and it starts on the micro and builds to the macro awesome amazing amazing value that you just give us here carl thank you so much um carl if people want to learn more about you and what you do where should they go well first it's uh my my website and my email are closely aligned my email address is carl c-a-r-l at carl pritchard P-R-I-T-C-H-A-R-D, Carl at CarlPritchard.com. And my website is obviously CarlPritchard.com. But I, if, if you have other questions, if you have other insights, and courtesy of, of Cesar and all the efforts that he puts into these things, I am the cost of an email. 
If you have any questions or concerns about anything we talked about here, I am perfectly amenable to you popping me an email, and I will get back to you within 24 hours, always. And I can vouch for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Carl, thank you for being so accessible. Uh, I know you have a, a lot on your plate, a lot of stickies to take care of. Yes, I do. Uh, um, and uh, I appreciate your time, and um, and I'm sure the, the listeners appreciate it as well. Thank you so much again, and uh, we'll uh, stay in touch. Thank you for the opportunity. Project Management for You. Breaking down project management and supplying you with tips, advice, and simple steps to turn your ideas into reality. Learn more at projectmanagementforyou.com. All right, I tell you, uh, Carl Pritchard is a natural teacher, as you can see. Um, and, and talking to him on this topic was really, really helpful to me. And, I, and I'm in this, in this industry for, for a long time, but he just has that natural gift of teaching. So thank you, Carl, for, uh, for being on the show. And um, everybody, please check out his website um, and, and get in touch with Carl. He's really a, a great guy. And I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Now, if you enjoy what you're hearing here and you'd like uh, maybe a step-by-step approach to using project management to start turning your ideas into reality, delivering on your promises and, and getting things done, head on over to projectmanagementforyou.com and consider backing this book project. And if you are listening to this episode way into the future, you'll be able to get a copy of the book at that address. Now, uh, I have the dates firmed up now and this campaign is going to run uh, throughout the month of October 2014 and the last day for you to come and help uh, back this project is November 1st, 2014 at midnight Eastern Standard Time. So uh, as I said at the beginning, I'm really happy and encouraged by the by the support I've had so far, but I'd, lo- I'd love for you to c- come and consider either backing it or sharing it with your community, with your friends, or maybe doing both. <laughs> So this is what I had for you today. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Carl Pritchard and have a great day and I'll talk to you tomorrow. And until then, remember that life is a project and you are the manager. Ciao, ciao. Thank you for listening. Tune in next time for more inspiring interviews and key information to help you get things done. Want to learn more? Go to projectmanagementforyou.com and order Caesar's book, Project Management for You. Your path of turning ideas into reality starts now.